Hi everyone, how are you doing today? My sister is not a huge reader, but she has excellent taste in film. And so when she told me to watch The Heiress, an old black and white film starring Olivia de Havilland, um, I was, I, it took me a while to get to it. I think just because old films are kind of hit and miss for me. But when I finally did watch it, I thought it was absolutely equal to the hype that she had given it and it became a, a instant old black and white favorite for me too. So I didn't know at the time that it was based on the novel Washington Square by Henry James. When I finally figured that out, I decided to get a copy of this. I saw this secondhand and the rest is history as they say and I really loved this book. As you can see, I took quite a few notes I will be going over spoilers in this review. I don't usually do that, but this story is not terribly, like there's not a lot in it in terms of plot. So it's really quite hard to do a review of it without going into some spoilers. So just a heads up, um, if you want to read it spoiler free, then maybe watch this review later. Um, but I'll just get right into it. So Washington Square, I think this takes place in the 1830s, and it is about this young lady, Catherine Sloper, and she is considered very plain and boring, if effectively, by everyone around her. Her father, her aunt who lives with them, and just about everyone who encounters her thinks she's you know, nice, but dull, basically. Um, she also, as, as is pointed out very early on, she loves fine things. So she and her father are very well off and Catherine enjoys fashion. She enjoys, um, dressing richly. Some might even say too old for her age. And, uh, I like this quote here. Um, she looks as if she had been married already. And you know they don't like married women. And by they, um, it's meant young men. Um, so, as Catherine, you know, she's both, you might say, socially awkward. She dresses old for her age and very richly. So, you know, just considered to be this awkward figure in society. And her father is a distinguished physician in the community. This is in New York. And he feels um, ashamed, ashamed of her, basically, disappointed in her. Um, Dr. Sloper had a, a wife and another child who died previously. So um, I guess the trope here is that, you know, he, his heart is still with those people who died and he has pretty much no affection left for Catherine. And the kicker here is he acts like an affectionate father. If anyone saw them together or saw Dr. Sloper, they wouldn't think Dr. Sloper is a bad father. He does all right things. He goes through all the actions. He provides everything for her, but he views her with disappointment and scorn and at times mockery. And she is only vaguely aware of this at the beginning, I would say. I don't think she starts out with that understanding. So what really kicks this novel off is um, this event. So she goes to this, I think it's an engagement party for her, hmm, I want to say her cousin or some distant relative, and she meets this handsome young man named Morris Townsend, who uh, is related to the um, fiance at this party. And for her, you know, she's she's never had somebody, you know, this dashing and and talkative and charming interested in her. She's very shy and introverted, but she and him, she and he uh, hang out quite a bit together at this party and he talks a lot to her and she just, you know, she's obviously falling in love, but she doesn't really know what that is. She just knows that she really, really likes him and he seems to be really interested in her. One thing I'll say is I've never read a Henry James novel before. 
So if you're looking for something of the scintillating um, deafness of Fitzgerald or, you know, some other author that's a little more, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but less direct maybe, um, this isn't it. Uh, Henry James, I would say, at least from this book, he takes his time introducing each character. He um, uses his ability as narrator to get inside their heads and tell you what they're thinking. So I would actually describe his writing style as fairly simplistic. It's certainly not, you know, of great brevity. There's some pretty long paragraphs here, but it, it's a pretty simple writing style. And I think he's nonetheless pretty good at it. But all that to say that that's the beginning of this conflict whereby um, Catherine falls in love with Morris Townsend and Catherine's father takes an immediate disliking to Morris and believes that he is out to get Catherine's money that she will um, come into when the doctor passes away. I think what one of the things that makes this story so fascinating to me is, well, yeah, just one of the things, because there's many. Um, there are several antagonists in this novel. Um, I've already alluded to Dr. Sloper and his lack of, um, I would say, good parenting, lack of true affection for his child. There is the aunt, Aunt Lavinia, who ostensibly cares about Catherine and is supposed to be her mother figure, but she becomes very attached to Morris and actually, it, like, effectively adopts him as her son and and begins to lean into his interests instead of Catherine's. Um, there's Morris, whose his interests in Catherine are a little bit questionable and become increasingly questionable throughout the novel. And, uh, well, th there's three right there. <laughs> and poor Catherine's in the middle of it all. And so really what this book is, because in spite of there being three antagonists, um, I think it's really centered on the relationship between Catherine and, and her father. Um, it's, it's about not just his disapproval of her, but this dependency that she has on him. She put off deciding and choosing before the vision of a conflict with her father. She dropped her eyes and sat motionless, holding her breath and waiting. It made her heart beat. It was intensely painful. Um, Catherine has, I would say, been conditioned to feel this great dependency on her father. I would say even above and beyond what was generally expected in this time period, um, to the extent that if she so much as thinks a thought that goes against him, she feels guilty. She feels very fearful and guilty. In fact, there's kind of a, a reference to that here. Um, where is it here? Catherine turned it over. Her father's words had such an authority for her that her very thoughts were capable of obeying him. There was a dreadful ugliness in it, which seemed to glare at her through the interposing medium of her own feebler reason. Um, that's the other thing is Catherine has an incredibly low self-esteem that Dr. Sloper has never helped her with, right? And so it's rather, it's rather a lot of him to, you know, think down on her for her faults when he hasn't instilled enough confidence in her to give her that push she needs to be assertive and discerning and wise and stand up for herself. He has instead created this dependency in which she must lean on him and his his reason. And the the great irony of this, and I think James's master stroke here, um, is Dr. Sloper's insistence that he is a loving, kind, good father. He makes these strange remarks throughout the book. You know, that there's this discussion about Morris Townsend having spent his own fortune, and at the end of it, uh, you know... Uh, Catherine's trying to defend Morris. She doesn't know him very well, but she, she's very attached to him at this point, tries to defend him. And the doctor kind of uh, rounds out the conversation by saying, you won't think me cruel, he said, holding her a moment in regards to his uh, disapproval. And, and there's other, uh, 
other other times where he asserts himself as not cruel. Uh, he says, she is past the age at which people are forbidden from marrying who they want. And I am not a father in an old fashioned novel, but I shall strongly urge her to break with you. Speaking to Morris Townsend. So it's one of those situations where, you know, somebody's saying something and it's kind of funny. They're, they're saying they're not something when all the evidence points to them being just that. Um, and of course, Dr. Sloper does it in this incredibly um, manipulative way because he's not outwardly saying she can't marry him. In fact, he's saying the opposite. He's saying, yep, it's up to you. Go, go marry Morris. But all of his actions, all of his emotional power that he has over her is geared to her feeling guilty about it and, um, you know, making her feel stupid and like she is not uh, discerning and that, you know, he, she's actually hurting her father um, by her behavior. They are both afraid of me, harmless as I am, the doctor answered, and it is on that that I build, on the salutary terror that I inspire. <laughs> so that's the other thing the doctor, um, he, he says everything with this kind of uh, offhanded humor, this irony. The doctor, again, is considered to be oh, an upstanding member of society, very brilliant and smart. And in his interactions with, Sh with Catherine, um, there's a distinct lack of any, any humility whatsoever. And, and this is him. And he also kind of is approaching this whole thing as a game, which is uh, really quite cold, I would say. Because this is, again, Catherine's great romance, and he's treating it just like it's, it's, it's funny to him. It's, it's a game. Now, the doctor does do something that's, that would be laudable if he was doing it for all the right reasons, but he goes to visit Mrs. Montgomery, who is Morris's sister. Morris is living with his sister and her, I think it's five children, and by all... All, all, uh, all appearances, he may be kind of uh, uh, leeching off of her generosity. It's not quite clear. I mean, he claims to have a little bit of residual property, but he may just be living off of her. And uh, Mrs. Montgomery warns Dr. Sloper, and after some, I would say, manipulative conversation on his part, he gets her to admit to him that um, she can't recommend Morris as a husband, and, and so that, that was an interesting and important development. Uh, Mrs. Montgomery doesn't have much presence in the book otherwise. And it's interesting that Catherine never goes to visit her herself. And I think that might be Catherine's one weakness, right? But again, I would point to Dr. Sloper's lack of good parenting as a reason for that. You know, he maybe he should have had her go visit Mrs. Montgomery instead of him taking this all on himself. Oh, poor Catherine. So she, as is going to be the case in these kinds of family situations, she wants to be able to reconcile all of the different conflicts in her life. Her terrible, um, I mean, yeah, her terrible relationship with her father, which she doesn't see as terrible. Um, and her love for Morris and, um, and, and James uses that word. She could not imagine herself imparting any kind of knowledge to her father. There was something superior even in his injustice and absolute in his mistakes, but she could at least be good. And if she were only good enough, heaven would invent some way of reconciling all things the dignity of her father's errors and the sweetness of her own confidence, the strict performance of her filial duties, and the enjoyment of Morris Townsend's affection. So that's really Catherine's core struggle is she wishes that things would just work out. You know, she doesn't, that she wouldn't have to choose between people, that she wouldn't have to see error in anyone. And that's, you know, that's a tribute to the sweetness of her nature, but it's not at all realistic. And, and uh, going back to Dr. Sloper, he, he treats her quite 
unkindly as the novel goes on in, in various scenes and he cares more about being right and I think that was something that really struck me about this it's not even that um the doctor is you know some kind of <laughs> stereotypical villain or disproving father I mean he's those things in a way but it's his main problem I would say is he cares more about being right than about being loving and instead of tempering or changing his approach through a mode of love and grace and fatherly affection he is so intent on being proven right about this Morris Townsend that he doesn't spare his father his um, daughter's feelings at all and so once Catherine starts to see that that he doesn't really care about her that much she changes and uh you know this happens fairly gradually in the book oh yes i, I like this <laughs> um and as to his being hard that surely in a man was a virtue you know that what i'm gonna say too here in this book is that i think this qualifies as a proto-feminist novel because it is examining this highly patriarchal relationship and about uh, Catherine's journey finding her, you know, agency in this situation. But it's so very gradual and it, it takes her such a long time. And I think that's one of the beauties of this book is that it seems very realistic. And I would say she even changes, you know, in spite of herself is how I'd put it. So... <laughs> So what, but what about their engagement? Uh, Char Catherine, I keep wanting to call her Charlotte. Catherine and Morris's engagement. So they have plans to get married. Dr. Sloper takes Catherine on a six month trip to Europe to try to distract her from Morris. And there's a scene that I don't, I don't think it's quite the same in the movie. There's a scene where they go out to the Alps and they're in this desolate landscape and they're, they're finally alone. There's no servants around. There's nobody. And Dr. Sloper just takes it out on poor Catherine. He just, he loses it. And because she hasn't been talking about Morris this whole time. And he just turns on her. And I think to me, that was one of the highlights of the book. Because he was finally kind of showing his true colors and letting his guard down. Because there was nobody else around. And the interesting thing too is that because they go on this trip to Europe, it puts um, Catherine's Aunt Lavinia on her own back at the house in Washington Square. And she kind of, I mean, lets loose, so to speak. She, she becomes even more attached to this Morris and lets him come over to the house and hang out a lot and, and benefit off of her hospitality. And so, you know, this trip to Europe is actually quite pivotal for all the characters, but not in the way Dr. Sloper intended. They, he actually extends it out for another six months. Um, Catherine comes back as determined as ever to be with Morris, and what does Morris do? Uh, he gives her the slow fade because uh, Dr. Sloper has determined she will not get any of her money that was going to come to her from him upon his death if she marries Morris. So once Morris catches wind of this and, you know, Catherine is not able to change her father's mind, um, Morris gives her the slow fade. Now in the movie, it's a little different. He, he kind of breaks it off a lot more cruelly and abruptly. Well, I wouldn't say more cruelly. I think the slow fade is pretty cruel as well, considering they had been away for a year already. You know, I think eventually he breaks it off officially in a letter, and that's when she realizes it's over. So that's, like, most of the book right there. It was almost her last outbreak of passive grief. At least she never indulged in another that the world knew anything about. So Catherine, um, that's like, that's like the end of it for her. Dr. Sloper, meanwhile, has not given up on his desire to be right, and she she refuses to promise him that she will never marry Morris. And so he takes a further step of 
taking away uh, four-fifths of the inheritance she would have had. And she only gets a, a little bit. Um, and then he, he dies. And then the last part of the book um, is about Catherine in the years ahead. How long ago it was, how old she had grown, how much she had lived. She had lived on something that was connected with him, and she had consumed it in doing so. So this great heartbreak of Catherine's is actually what propels her to, you know, just become more of a, a self, if that makes sense. Like she um, becomes involved in her community. She becomes a mentor to young people. She is a wealthy and beautiful and, uh, you know, nicely dressed old spinster. She continues her hobbies. Um, you know, who's to say whether she's happy, but she, um, I, I think Marianne Guevara said this in her review, you know, she finds contentment. I think that's a really great way of putting it. So again, with, with the proto-feminist themes, you know, she doesn't, she's actually become quite a full person on her own. And if she had married Morris by some, you know, whatever means, if, if they had, if that had worked out somehow, I suspect that she would have merely been replacing her father for another overbearing man. And it's actually, I think, quite a good ending in a way. I won't say what happens when they meet again, but it was a very satisfying ending. I think I like the ending of the movie a bit better. It's a little more dramatic and intense. Um, but the ending in the novel, uh, Catherine maintains every bit of dignity, every bit of her, um, her grace and her patience and her um, pureness of heart, I would say, you know. So she's learned some things, but she's a better and stronger version of herself. So I really loved this book. Um, I've gone on about it much longer than I thought I was going to, um, but it's certainly a highlight of the year, and uh, I can't recommend it strongly enough. Hey everyone, I just wanted to do a quick little uh, note here at the end about the title of the book, Washington Square, which I forgot to mention. I think the title, so initially I thought the title was a little staid, boring, maybe not that great. The title of the movie is The Heiress, which is a little more immediate and arresting. But I think the title Washington Square is actually incredibly appropriate. Washington Square is where she and her father live. It's her father's prestigious place of residence. When she first lives there, it's a prison, I would say. Um, just in the way that her father and her aunt are so overbearing. You know, Catherine, once she does come into a little money, um, she has the ability to go elsewhere. She could move if she wanted to, but by that time, she has made Washington Square her own. She has come into her um, ownership of the place, in every sense of the word. And she likes it. She enjoys living there. And, you know, it's her home. She was always fond of her home. So I think it's a great title for a book. Um, maybe uh, not the most uh, uh, clickbait worthy, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So that's just, just a note on the title. So thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.